Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in today. This is a very exciting conversation. I'm very excited to be joined by Manitoba's Treaty Relations Commissioner, Loretta. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for being here. And I know it's a different format this year. We're, we're doing things a little bit pandemic style. Right. But um, for folks who maybe don't know what a Treaty Relations Commissioner is, maybe that's actually where we should start. Um, what's your job? Ah, now you're going to test me. Um, <laughs> well, the Treaty Relations Commissioner, um, I guess, is the spokesperson uh, for the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba. And the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba is um, an independent organization that um, looks to bringing a better understanding of what the treaties were all about, those that were here in Manitoba. I mean, that's why it's Manitoba. We're actually a federal organization. Okay. Um, independent of both First Nation and government, albeit we get funding from the federal government, but it's um, our mandate is to bring a better understanding of the treaties um, because there are two parties to the treaties that were entered here in Manitoba, the Crown and First Nations. Um, and for, for many years, the treaties have not been implemented, certainly not to the perspective of First Nations people. And there was a clear um, need uh, over the years to bridge this understanding. And so the commission was thought to be the body that was able to do that. And so education is a big part uh, of what the commission okay. does. Research is also a big part of what needs to be done. And then the third um, part of what we do is to facilitate dialogue. And facilitation of dialogue hopefully brings around some of the action that's required to implement those treaties. There we go. Right? And so my job then okay. as the commissioner is to try and steer the commission um, in that direction into to work on different projects and to help build bridges in terms of the understanding of treaties. Wow, that sounds like a pretty broad, pretty broad scope uh, for your job. No big deal, just everything in the kitchen sink. Yeah. Um, so for folks who maybe are tuning in and are interested in treaties, but maybe don't have a huge understanding of what they are, how do you explain what a treaty is to somebody who is uninitiated? Well, I mean, there's, there's lots of uh, I guess, different types of treaties. But when I'm talking about the treaties here in Manitoba, it really is that relationship that was um, brought together through treaties between First Nations people and non-First Nations people through the Crown, the British Crown. And in, if we're talking about the number of treaties in 1871, um, and it was really uh, an understanding or an agreement of how we were going to share these lands. Mm. And what came out of um, that time period was a couple of things. One is the First Nation perspective and, and First Nation history about those treaties is an oral history and an oral understanding and it's passed down through their songs and through their dances and through their languages that embeds what actually happened at that time period. The uh, non-First Nation understanding or the Crown's um, understanding of treaty was uh, reduced to a piece of paper, mm. right, that was to record some of the understandings and agreements. And it's it's understood that not everything made it into the written piece of paper or the, the written treaty, part of the treaty. And so it's it's come to be the challenge that the parties have to get back to that original understanding and what was the understanding, what was agreed to um, beyond those written pieces of paper. So I guess that's where that facilitation piece of your job comes in, of bringing folks together to say, what's your understanding of the treaty and how can we not only modernize it so that it's like applying to today, but also understand that original intention. Exactly, right? And so if you look at the First Nation perspective, it was how do we coexist? Because the, there was no, and, and we hear our elders talk about it, there was no surrender, there was no conquering, there was none of, uh, none of that. It, it was an agreement to share the land so mm. that people could coexist and continue to be who they were, like yeah. both, both sides, right? I've, I've heard this myself in, in the oral teachings that I've heard from knowledge keepers here in Manitoba about how there was no surrender and, and, and it, it was agreement of sharing. Yeah. Right? That concept of sharing. Sharing the land. It's yeah. what we teach our kids. Absolutely. Right? 
it, it, it's a basic um, value that we all hold. And so when it came to the treaties, that was one of the basic things there is, is, is a sharing of the land. It wasn't a surrender of the land, okay. um, despite the fact that those words, seed, yield, and surrender, appear in the written text of the treaties. So, so right? there's the thing people have there's to think the, about. There's that, that difference of understanding of what a treaty even is based on who you're asking. Exactly. So, okay, so maybe related to that, um, we are all treaty people. Mm-hmm. It's it's a common phrase. Um, it's becoming, I think, maybe more common in Manitoba to hear kind of uh, leaders and influential folks say, we are all treaty people. But I'm curious, you're the treaty commissioner. Mm-hmm. What does that even mean? Well, I think we've all um, benefited from that treaty relationship, right? Um, many When we think about the treaties, again, we go back to this uh, reduction that it's uh, a surrender of land in exchange. First Nations people were given certain rights, uh, hunting, fishing, treaty right to education, those types of things. So it's reduced to that. But in fact, it's much broader than that. It's a responsibility on both parties to go back to how do we maintain this coexistence? How do we maintain this respect so that you can be who you are without interference from me, right? Mm. So it's a respect of values. It's a respect of way of life. And if you actually look at the treaty medal, and many of us hasn't, but I see you have one on your lapel there. (laughs) And you see two people coming together, shaking hands, if you can see, yeah, see it. And you can Google it for those that may not have seen. Type in Treaty Metal and, and you'll see um, two individuals coming together, shaking hands. And in the background, you'll see teepees if you look really close. And those teepees represent mm. the, the First Nation way of life would continue. And the so, other side, there's a the sun. And then there's a the sun. And then there's water. And, of course, they're standing on land. Which mm. So the the term of this relationship is for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the waters flow. And oh, and you see it right there in the metal. And it's right there on the metal. You know, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? I've probably talked a thousand words already just trying to describe <laughs> that. So it's true. Like all of that is encapsulated within that. And it's it's a digging down to saying, okay, what does that mean? And as you said, in modern terms, what does that mean for us today? Yeah. Right? Because people always say, well, that happened 150 years ago or, you know, and so it had nothing to do with me. But it, absolutely it does. Yeah. And I hear people saying, right? like, treaty is like something that's old. Um, treaty has nothing to do with me. Yeah. And so, like, I think about for, um, I'll just say it, the white folks mm-hmm. um, that I've come across and newcomer folks that I've worked with in the community, often they're like, that was back then. It has nothing to do with me. But I see people that are like Caucasian and new to this community as being especially privy to the responsibilities of treaty um, because those folks are benefiting from this land. Yeah. And I think maybe if people look at treaty from like a land benefit perspective, um, maybe that is a way for us to think about us all being treaty people. Because if you benefit from the land, that doesn't just come out of nowhere. That comes from treaty. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it allowed, like, again, First Nations people said, yeah, you know, there's enough land here for you to come here, um, live off of the right. land, and live the way that you've always lived. So whether you're Caucasian, whether, uh, you know, you're a Muslim, whatever it is, your the treaties were set up so that you could come here, um, benefit from the land, and be who you are. And so that is to carry on for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the waters flow, and... Um, so it, it applies um, forever. And so those of us that continue to come in and live on this land, that's the benefit, mm. right? So that's your treaty benefit from um, those treaties that were entered 150 years ago. So we're still benefiting. Many of us are still benefiting from that. So if Manitoba was ever a safe place for you, you are a beneficiary of treaty. Absolutely. Wow. If you're coming and you're allowing to, to live off the land and prosper and, and live the way you've always lived and your belief system, that's a benefit of those treaties. Wow. So, okay. So, what, so now this is shifting maybe some people's understandings of what a treaty is, how it applies to me. But now what? What do I do? Like I'm, I've, I've listened to us have this conversation. I now understand that maybe I benefit from the land, um, but that means I have a responsibility Who is that responsibility to? What am I supposed to? How do I fulfill it? Um, I feel like now, uh, as people get this understanding, they're going to feel rightfully indebted Mm -hmm. to, you know, they're like, oh, 
crap, I didn't ha- fulfill my end of the bargain, so to speak. Right. Um, so now people are probably wondering, how do I? How do I fulfill my end of the bargain? Well, I think we take a look at what that history of that relationship has been, right? We start, we, we get an understanding of what was intended through the treaty, certainly from a First Nation perspective. And the Crown had its own motives as well, right? To, of course, of course. Um, open up for settlement and et cetera, et cetera. But now we look at the, our treaty partner, the, let's take a look at the First Nation people. And for them, it didn't unfold the way that they had intended. So Mm -hmm. we look at um, First Nation communities, uh, we see the the high suicide rates, we see the um, poverty rate, high poverty rates, we see all of these that they've, that's what they've gotten out of treaty, right? And it it hasn't been um, fair, so to speak. So and even the system today, if we look at events like residential schools, the Indian Act, all of those were intended to deprive First Nation of people of, of their land, but of who they are. Mm. So how do we get back to that? How yeah. do we get back to First Nation values, to First Nation uh, way of being? We look at the child welfare system. You know, it's not a First Nation system, but mm-hmm. it was imposed on First Nations people, yep. and we've lost generations of people as a result of an imposed system. Yeah. So how do? what is the First Nation system of dealing with children? Mm. How do we make space for those systems within our existing society, and what do we need to do to be able to do that? And some of it is huge, absolutely. Um, some of it is small, though. Some of it is just having a conversation and getting to know each other. Some right? of it is just don't be racist. Absolutely. Some of it is getting rid of some of those perceptions and beliefs that have been perpetuated over years and years, mm-hmm. and it's challenging those. And in fact, you know, some of the um, courses that we do through the Treaty Relations Commission is going to the schools and talking to young people and having mm-hmm. things. And we've had teachers come to us um, at different times and say, you know, we've we've taught treaties in the classroom, and we when we kind of open the eyes of some of these young people, some of them now come and say. I didn't realize my parents were racist because of the views, because of the way that they've looked at First Nations people. And mm. so it's, it's education is power, right? And once you start to have that education about what the treaties are, I think it'll empower more than just First Nations people, but all of us to make the changes that we need. So this gets me to thinking about all the people that are like in charge of the world out there um, and how much they probably would benefit if they had a better, a deepened understanding of what treaty actually means and what their responsibility to this land is. Mm-hmm. Um, but even if we boil it down to the simple understanding of treaty that you were saying is like way too basic, but mm-hmm. it's kind of, even that didn't get respected, right? Mm-hmm. Like if, if we're supposed to share the land and, and First Nations people are supposed to get X amount of rights, I think we can all agree. Um, and I, I see the memes floating around all the time about it. Um, all these treaty rights and I'm still not treated right. Right. And so I think the reality for First Nations people from an urban context, but even from a broader Manitoba context, is that um, even the simple version of treaty is not being respected because we aren't, as uh, First Nations families, having the opportunity to raise our kids Mm -hmm. um, in the way that we believe. And, you know, like these systems are so set up that like the the poverty and the suicide, you mentioned it, Mm -hmm. um, make living a good life. Right? We want to have... We want to have that good life for ourselves and our little ones and our children and future generations, but it's hard to imagine um, when we're still not treated right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, and that's why you need your treaty partner, Mm. right? That's why you need people that can influence people in those positions to make changes, um, to step up and do so. And, um, I mean, any relationship is not an easy one. I've never been into in a relationship that's, that's easy, even being a mom. It's difficult being a mom. Um, you know, all of those types of things, there's challenges, but it's taking the time to understand what the needs of the other party is Mm. or the other person and trying your best to, to address those needs. And I think there needs to be more dialogue for First Nations people, you know, and I think of myself going through uh, the formal school system and and you probably as well. The school system wasn't designed to make me feel proud of who I was. Nope. And, you know, you already have that huge strike against you feeling that you're less than um, other people. And to overcome that is, is difficult. And so we have, as First Nations people, have our own uh, growing to do in terms of understanding what our history is uh, and to be proud of that history. And 
slowly, I think we're starting to to see that. Um, when I look at the, my my children, are my gauge, right? Are my current gauge of how society is, and I start to see um, some of that positiveness in in the school systems, mm. and and I credit. Um, you know, institutions even like the Treaty Relations yeah. Commission who are getting into the classroom and challenging teachers and those teachers that are taking up that challenge and saying, yes, you know, this is a different way of teaching. This is a different way of looking at the treaties. And we have to put value on the treaties. They haven't been valued, yep. right? They were just viewed as a land surrender and, and that was it. We have all the land and so we get to tell you what we're doing with the land and that changes the whole um, power we have all the imbalance. Land. We have all the power. Uh, yeah, it's a complete power imbalance, yeah. and and it's this um, belief then that um, affects that entire relationship. Yeah. So I want us to think maybe about next steps for treaty in Manitoba, and maybe what is the hope um, that we see out there. When I think about kind of our conversation we've been having mm-hmm. here. Um, I'm reminded of something I see from a lot of young people, and that's a hashtag that they use called Land Back. Mm-hmm. What does Land Back mean to you in terms of like honoring treaties? Well, I think that uh, there's a lot of things. And, and we have had some people, um, farmers, who, who have said, I want to give my land back. You know, like physically, literally give my land back. Wow, who do I give powerful. it to? That's right? powerful. So I have a lot of land titles now, and I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> and they give it to me. No, no. Um, so there's, there's that, where people literally say, if, if this is how I receive my land through treaty, then I want to return it, right? Mm-hmm. So there is that portion. The other, though, is looking at access to land, yes. right? And, and I think yes. that's a big part of it. When, you, you know, First Nations, the reserves were never meant to be the extent to which First Nations could use the land it was never meant to be that, but it's become that. Mm. Um, and so I think when we talk about land back, it's having access to the land to be who you are as a First Nation yeah. people. And we have to have that dialogue. How do we uh, share that land again? And it, we have to get away from the ownership concept I own, so I can tell you what to do with it. But it's being able to access the land and use it in the way that First Nations people need in order for First Nations societies to um, prosper, right? And that's going to be different mm. for each as well. Well, I think something that I just, I, I, I wish for everyone listening to this right now, that they would just say this sentence, I am the land. I feel like that mm-hmm. will help things. I am the land. And the reason why is because what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. Exactly. And I don't know, I just think we've done such a bad job of taking care of Mother Earth yeah. and the land so far. And if anybody listening is a landowner, I'm talking to you. Yeah. Um, so land back is a concept that I think could be foundational to how we move forward with treaties. Um, where, where do you see the most hope? What's, what's making you excited for the future? Um, do you believe that the treaties are going to be honored? I, I have to. You know, I think that there's a lot of things that are going around um, in the world and we look um, for guidance in many places, such as UNDRIP, right? The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We use that as a framework. And I always say, you know what? The framework was established over 150 years ago when we first got together to decide how we're going to live together. The framework is there. We just have to understand. We just have to feel um, the pride in that original relationship. And and again, when I see the young people, um, they're taking, they're they're starting to feel proud yeah. of who they are. And I think once you feel proud of who you are, you're going to be stronger, you're going to act differently. Um, and we have to, uh, I guess one of the biggest obstacles that I still worry about is this fear, mm. right? Fear that somehow we're giving something up as, non first, uh, as a non-First Nation person or government, that you're giving something up, and yet you're, you're giving so much, right? You're making that space for First Nation people, First Nation societies, First Nation values, which are all wonderful. If you ever get to talk and, and yeah. experience a First Nation um, conversation or a ceremony, it, it's beautiful. And um, so I see hope because I see a lot of uh, First Nation people going back. Um, to understanding who they are and finding their own journeys. And I see a lot of non-First Nation people taking the time to understand as well. Mm. And so that's what gives me hope, right? And and I hope um, that I get to see some of that change even in, in my lifetime. 
So <laughs> if Manitoba was a person, let's pretend like I'm Manitoba. Mm-hmm. Hey, what's up, Treaty Commissioner? Um, what do you want from me? What do you want from me as a province? What, what would you like me to do? Want me to scratch your back? <laughs> well, I think, you know, when you talk about governments, right, and, and we hear this from, from governments, provincial and federal, that um, we recognize First Nation governments. Um, it's a nice word. It's a nice it's phrase, nice words. but what does it mean, where right? And action? and where is the action? And um, and it's not even the action of well, he, we're going to give um, you some money so that we can figure out our relationship. It's actually making space, right? It's saying okay, how do we and having those tough conversations? What do we need to do within our own systems to make that space? And sitting down and saying yes, we need to change. X, Y, and Z laws because they don't reflect this treaty relationship. And so it's, it's again, sitting down and taking a hard look at that system and saying, where can we make change? Child mm. and Family Services is a perfect example. That's the one I'm always going to you as know? my default. I'm like, when, when things are going well in Child and Family Services in this province, then I'll believe that things are going yeah. better for treaty because to me, a big part of treaty is like family. Yeah. Right? We're supposed to be family. We're supposed to respect family. And right now I feel like First Nations families are not being respected by Child and Family Services. So I hope Treaty can help that. That would be so great. Yeah. And, you know, there's this um, wonderful case um, that went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada on um, about Child and Family Services. And I think we need to be reminded of that case. And it came out of Manitoba. So it's hope for Manitoba, and, and I really believe that it is. And, and it was, um, I'm going to date myself, not because I was a young lawyer at this time, but it's in the <laughs> 90s. And um, at that time, we had these uh, local child care committees. We no longer have them as part of the, the um, child and family service system. And they were made up of people in the community who knew the families. So if a family came into care or in need of um, help, they would bring in a teacher or a nurse or whomever in the community knew the family and said, how can we help Johnny, little Johnny there, right? And so, um, but due to privacy laws now, they've they've done away with that, right? So um, in any event, uh, this one community came forward and said, we have... um, this young mom who, who needs help. She can't do that for herself, but as the larger community, it's, it's our responsibility to look after her and her unborn child. So we want you to put her in rehab to get the help that she needs. And so the agency did that. Um, mom gets a lawyer and, and the lawyer says, you can't do that. Mom's of age. She's an adult. She can do what she wants. She can, you know, as a young woman, she has can do what she wants with her body as yeah. well. And so... This case goes all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada says, while we understand community that you want to step in, that you want to help, um, that you want to help like uh, the unborn child, in Canadian law, it's different. So you had Canadian law versus First Nation beliefs, First Mm. Nation law essentially, where as soon as um, the baby was conceived, it was a life, and they felt they had a responsibility towards that life. In Canadian law, unless the once the it wasn't a human until it was born, oh. so you have this clash of values, and That's so that difference of beliefs. You were absolutely earlier. those hey. are those two different yeah. beliefs, and so the Supreme Court said no. While that's all nice and dandy, the the supreme law is the Canadian law, and this is how you apply. So wow. the, the community then was removed from that situation. And so that was like 25 years ago. So imagine if 25 years ago the Supreme Court of Canada said, hey, let's make some space here for the First Nation way of looking after their family, their communities. Where would our child and family service system be? 25 wow. years, that's like a, a good generation. Yeah, that's a, one whole generation. That could have been... Yep. Saved yep, in many ways, right? Could so have been when you with their families and so when you on their land, yeah. So when you're asking about province of Manitoba, what can I do? There's a perfect example, mm. right? Of saying, okay, how can we look at our system and and make space and make the proper space? Well, and I think what that does actually is it part of my little strategy of asking you that question is if we can imagine a province doing it, then every single person listening has no excuse. 
Because Absolutely. as individuals, we can do it too. Yeah. We can ask ourselves that question of what can I do to be a good treaty partner? Yes. Um, if I'm safe, if I'm housed, if, you know, if yeah. I'm here, then I am a beneficiary of treaty and I have a responsibility to that treaty to make sure that my treaty partners are taken care of in the same way. And that's exactly it. That's exactly it. You know, one of the um, parts of the, the treaty making process was that each party was to come back annually. And we have treaty days, right? In First Nation communities, we have treaty <laughs> days every year. Part it's of fun. that process was the parties come together and say, how are you doing? What what do you need? What don't you need? Like, And how can we help each other, right? That oh. was supposed to be part of that treaty day celebration. But it just turned into the but $5. But it just bucks. turned into the $5. It's like, it's reduced, yeah. right? The, the, the broad principles become reduced to, to smaller things. Did you ever do the inflation math for the $5? I, I haven't, but there are a number of yeah. them that are out there. I wonder, yeah. I wonder about that. What would the $5 be? today versus five dollars back in the 1800s yeah <laughs> and there's a lot of conversations just about the five dollars yeah. you know that are out there but um yeah there, there's a lot of things that we can be doing yeah it's well it's encouraging right treaty relations commission is doing a lot of the stuff um that we need especially from that education side as you mentioned um and i know i'm really excited about treaty and i think that we can do better mm-hmm and so, you the know. challenges will come back next year, Michael. Yes, let's come and back we'll next year. And we'll say, what have we done? In. And yeah. what, what's changed? Yeah, and right. so like I think about it, um, you are doing a lot of stuff as the treaty commissioner to make sure folks understand what treaties are and how we are all treaty people. Um, I think about myself as, as a random individual in the mm -hmm. community. Um, and I think of our listeners. They're a bunch of random individuals too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for us random individuals, I love that question of how can I be a good treaty partner? And maybe just as an example for our listeners, something that I, I was thinking of is for me, um, I want to look a little bit more in to the research that the Treaty mm -hmm. Relations Commission has done. So maybe I can have a bit of a better understanding of some of those foundational differences that you mentioned that have made it all the way up to places like the Supreme Court, yeah. where, you know, First Nations perspectives aren't considered. And I don't really like that. Mm -hmm. I don't, that doesn't sound right to me. So there's, so there's a very clear situation that I've now identified as an individual within a legal system mm -hmm. that is like, that can be a target for me. So now I can go hang out with all my lawyer friends at the Public Interest Law Center and find all these other people that are like, we care about social justice. And I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, team of lawyers, let's change this law. Yeah. Now, I'm only one person. Yeah. Every single person listening has that capacity. I want all y'all people to go wrangle your lawyers out there. <laughs> find all your influential decision-making types and say, let's be good treaty partners. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And you know, we all have a treaty story. Mm. Right. And that and that's the other challenge in terms of what can you do as individuals? Find out what your treaty story is, you know, and, and again, come back next year and say, this is my treaty story. This is how I've benefited mm. from treaty. And then you, you can take it then to the next step and say, this is what I'm going to do to be a good treaty partner. And I think that right. if, if people maybe are confused, look at the way that you benefited. Yeah. That's the way you help others. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't know what to do, like, how did you get helped? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have a place to live? Does everybody have a place to live? Yeah. Get busy. Help make sure everyone's got a place to live. Yeah. Simple. I mean, you know, simple, just world peace. Yeah. Like, it doesn't have to be a huge, if it, if it can be huge, fantastic. But, you know, it, it all, it's, it's got to start somewhere. And I think that's the key thing is it has to start. Yeah, and well, and all the little individual things that we do hopefully will add up to the transformation that we want mm -hmm. so that treaties, First Nations people are respected in this province. Right. And I hope that we can be a leader in the country to show what that looks like. I know we can be a leader. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Loretta. And thank you to all of our listeners for proving us right mm -hmm. um, by getting to work. Miigwech. Good stuff. Like I say, thank you. Mm-hmm.